stamina. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Today we are talking about semi-active radar homing and mine. The stuff that we're going to cover is very difficult to find elsewhere on YouTube, so stay till the end. If this is your first time here, please subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss any episode in this series. Let's get started. What is inside a semi-active radar homing missile? Well, as usual, you have a propulsion sector, a warhead, a guidance section, and a radar. The difference is that with semi-active radar homing, the radar at the tip of the missile, it is just a receiver. It is not a fully-fledged radar, as in the case of active radar homing. So the concept is simple. The fighter plane normally has a powerful and very efficient radar, so why we don't use this radar to illuminate the target with electromagnetic energy and have this electromagnetic energy received by the missile radar. So this electromagnetic energy will be used either by the missile to generate its commands or by the fighter to generate the commands for the missile to guide it toward the target. So in principle, the radar receiver will feed the line of sight angles to the guidance section. The guidance section will move the aerodynamic surfaces that will guide the missile toward the target. Cup of tea, right? And indeed, this is a brilliant idea because a radar is quite a large and cumbersome piece of equipment and fitting a fully-fledged radar within a slender body of the missile, which is necessary uh, to be like this for aerodynamic reasons, um, yes, it's a problem. So if we fit just the receiver, it will be lighter, simpler and less prone to falls. Since semi-active radar homing started in the late 40s, beginning of the 50s, when we were still in the era of analog electronics with vacuum tubes, definitely weight, size, reliability and power consumptions were to be considered as factor in the missile design. Every guidance system has different components and we won't go into the details now. However, in general, missile guidance systems have input parameters. Some of them are relative to the target, for example, the line of sight angles. Some others are relative to the missile flight, like the speed or the angle of attack or pitch, roll and yo, or any other missile parameter. These parameters are fed to some electronics, which in turn produce movements to the aerodynamic surfaces, which are by far the most common way of controlling an air-to-air -air missile. The net effect that you want to produce is a lateral acceleration of the missile, because the lateral acceleration is a measure on how quick and how efficiently the missile can turn. However, there is enough public domain information out there to safely say that guidance laws falls into three main categories. The first type of guidance laws is the line of sight guidance. Historically, they were the first to be implemented because they are the easiest to be implemented. The concept is rather simple. You try to keep the target on the line joining the control point, which is the launching plane, and the target. If you keep the missile in that position and the missile keep going, well, eventually do you may expect that the missile will get close enough to the target for the fuse to go off. There are two ways of actually implementing line of sight guidance, command line of sight and beam rider. In command line of sight, the fighter radar tracks the target and the missile together and then the fighter sends commands to the missile to basically stay on track. If you want, this is not strictly active radar homing, it is just the missile guided at a distance. With beam rider, the missile senses the radar beam and tries to stay inside the beam itself. 
the fighter needs to keep the beam pointed to the target. This, for example, was the type of guidance used by the first version of the Sparrow missile. The problem with this guidance is that it is basically like trying to hit a target with a dog on a leash. The trajectory is far from optimal and the lateral acceleration tend to be the highest in the final phase of the flight. Uh, so it is going to bleed energy when energy is actually at premium and is needed the most. So basically this kind of guidance is useless against any kind of target that is actually able to maneuver a little bit. Another type of guidance laws used by a semi-active radar home missiles is a push-shoot algorithm. The idea behind this is to keep the velocity vector of the missile pointed toward the target. Again, if you keep the velocity vector pointed toward the target, at some point you will get close to it and the fuse will go off and the warhead will do the rest. So the missile actually receives the reflected energy from the target and points toward it or maybe to a point slightly in front of it. The trajectory flown with this kind of guidance loss is slightly better than the previous one but still is not very efficient and still has the problem of requiring a very high acceleration in the final phase of the flight. Probably the most efficient guidance laws for semi-active radar homing is proportional navigation. The term originated in seafaring, but today we may say that it refers to the fact that the lateral acceleration is proportional to the line of sight variation and to a constant that, that pretty much is a measure of how hard the missile is going to turn. With such a low, you can distribute the lateral acceleration in most of the trajectory. You are not going to bleed uh, a lot of energy, especially in the final stage of the uh, navigation. Also note that this kind of loss seems to sort of predict the point of impact of the missile, even though it's not a real prediction. The radars used by military planes are normally pulse Doppler sets. However, semi-active radar homing missiles use continuous wave as an illuminator. In fact, even today, most radar sets are actually able to operate in a continuous wave mode just to guide semi-active radar homing missiles. We will cover the difference between the two types uh, in detail in a different video, but for now it's enough to say that a pulse Doppler radar set emits a series of pulses, trains of pulses, while a continuous wave illuminator emits uh, just a continuous wave. A continuous wave illuminator doesn't provide the distance to the target, but a measure in the Doppler effect can provide the target speed. The advantage of a continuous wave illuminator is that it's possible to have quite high energy density on the target for a long period of time. In this case, even the reflected energy will be higher. This was sort of necessary considering that the first generations of missiles used a conical scan seeker. In this system, the receiver is not connected to a single antenna, but two. And the two antennas are oriented slightly off the missile center line, slightly off bore site. With this arrangement, the received signal will be stronger in one antenna rather than the other. So let's say if the signal is stronger on the right side than in the left side, then the missile will be on the right side of the missile and uh, the guidance system will try to steer the missile toward the right. Obviously, this identifies the position of the target on a line, and to identify the position of the target in two dimensions, you just have to rotate the seeker head. That is, the whole antenna complex is mechanically rotating. And there are a few issues with this solution. The first one is that we don't really like mechanical solutions because 
they are heavier, they're more complex, they require more maintenance than a purely solid state electronic one. But this is just a generic point. There are actually are three very specific issues. So the first issue is that when the target reflection ceases to be a point, it is when the missile is close to the target and we have reflection from different parts of the target, then all these reflection actually confuse, sort of, the uh, guidance system and so the missile tends to overcorrect when it's close to the target. Again, that's the stage of the flight where um, the energy is most required to follow the target that is maneuvering. As a result, the accuracy of this kind of guidance is not very high and uh, sometimes a very large warhead may be necessary to be effective. The second issue is that it is impossible to distinguish between target reflections and other reflections. Well, to be fair, there's not much around in the sky unless you point the sensor downward. In this case, you will have a massive reflection from the ground that will blind the radar. This is the problem which is referred with the expression look down, shoot down, that in the 70s and the 80s actually divided the haves from the have-nots. The third issue is that a conical scan sensor is very easy to jam. Since a conical scan sensor extracts the target information only from the signal strength, while it is basically enough to radiate enough energy toward the missile to confuse the sensor. Even a simple technique like a slight delay in the jam emission can create a false target and fool the missile. Actually, techniques like these are nothing new because they were in use since the Second World War when the British tried to jam the, um, the German night fighters radars. Actually, we have known a solution to all of these issues since the Second World War. But we were never able to actually apply it in practice because it has been too computationally heavy till quite recently. What I'm talking about is the inverse monopulse seeker. Explaining in detail the way it works is honestly quite complicated. If you are up for a very technical explanation with uh, some mathematics, please let me know in the comments below. I'm definitely happy to do that. However, the idea is to have the radar to emit two short, in the range of milliseconds, pulses on uh, two slightly divergent directions. The radiation of each beam is polarized on a different axis, and this polarization remains even in the reflected echo from the target. So, if the signal is splitting components according to the original polarization, we can determine the direction of the target with a very high degree of accuracy. Uh, we are talking about a tenth of a degree and in more recent uh, systems, even much more precise. Monopole seekers do not rotate, so there are no mechanical components. They filter out the ground reflection because the ground reflection is not polarized, so it is basically ignored, and the jamming signal must be polarized in the same way as the energy emitted by the fighter, which is practically impossible. Flip side is that the electronic required to extract the signal and process it is much more complicated than with the conical scan. So, in practice, it wasn't possible till the 70s to use this kind of sensor in missiles because the electronic was not small enough to fit. In those years, weapons like the British Skyflash or the Italian Aspide actually demonstrated how this kind of seekers were much more effective than the previous generation. The first generation of semi-active radar homing missiles did not perform well. During the Vietnam War, for example, American pilots preferred the infrared homing Sidewinder 
or the cannon as a weapon in air-to-air -air combat. The performance is improved uh, drastically when monopulse seekers were adopted in the late 70s and in the 80s, but even in this way, the performance of the Sparrow, for example, during Desert Storm was at meh level. This is the reason why today semi-active radar homing, at least in air-to-air -air combat, tends to be replaced by active radar homing, but still many air forces have large stocks of these previous generation's missiles. Obviously, semi-active radar homing is simpler and less expensive than active radar homing. But the reason why active radar homing is replacing semi-active radar homing is actually connected to the effectiveness, obviously, but also to the tactical flexibility that active radar homings allow to the launcher. The point is that semi-active radar homing constrains the movement of the launcher because the launcher needs to keep pointing the radar toward the target. And exactly in the moment where you want to escape and go defensive because you expect that your enemy is going to fire against you, well, you need to keep going because you need to keep guiding your missile. Active radar homing, which can be fire and forget, doesn't have this problem. We have just scratched the surface and mind if in air-to-air -air combat semi-active radar homing is becoming a thing of the past. In, for example, surface-to-air, this technology is still well alive and kicking, and we will talk about this in a different video. In the meanwhile, if you're interested in active radar roaming, guidance laws, and other miscellaneous stuff about uh, air-to-air missiles, please go and watch the videos beside me, because I am sure you will be interested. So let me know in the comments below what, uh, what you want to know about uh, semi-active radar homing. I will be happy to answer at the best of my capacity. And for the moment being, thank you for watching and goodbye. Thank you.